Hello everyone, I'm Barbara Ham Lee. No matter the conflict, many in the armed forces decide that the military is the place for them to be, and they serve their 20 or more years with pride and the expectation that they will retire with full benefits. So what happens when the military decides that your service will be terminated before you are ready to go? It's called involuntary separation. And up next, we'll talk about why it happens and the impact upon service members and their families. It's all a part of our Another View (laughs) Veterans Initiative. And Another View is next, right after this news from NPR. Discussing today's topics from an African-American perspective, this is Another View. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Another View. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. Before we start on today's show, I want to take a very a moment to just say thank you to those who attended last night's Together in Education or TIE Awards sponsored by the Norfolk Education Foundation. Your attendance helped the foundation provide much-needed funds for teachers to implement creative and innovative programs in the classroom. And as president of NEF, I just want to say thank you, and we really, really appreciate your support. WHRO Public Media has embarked on a multi-year initiative that celebrates our veterans, examines challenges unique to those who have served, and provides access to resources. Our goal is to engage our community to help support veterans as they transition to civilian life. You can find out more about our initiative at whro.org slash veterans. Today on Another View, we're going to discuss involuntary separation. It's the term term used when a service member plans to make a career of military service, but Uncle Sam has other ideas. Please welcome Michael Crockett, a Navy veteran. Michael, how are you? I'm doing good. Thank you for having me. Thank you for coming. And joining us by phone is Eric Montalvo, who is is an attorney who served as a military prosecutor and defense attorney and is a Marine veteran. How are you, Eric? I'm well. Thank you for having me as well. Thank you so much for joining us. So, Eric, I want to start with you. Um, Explain exactly what the term involuntary separation means in terms of the military. Is it the equivalent of being laid off in the civilian world? Well, that's an interesting uh, analogy. Um, It it is and it isn't. Um, You know, the qualitative nature of military service is unlike anything you would find in the civilian world. And what I mean by that is, um, uh, particularly in the Navy uh, and and across the services, you have a population of people who have sacrificed in a lot of different ways. For example, going out on six-month deployments, eight-month deployments, the Army, as we know, you know, in Afghanistan was up to 18-month deployments. So you have people who have left their family for significant periods of time, have put themselves in harm's way, and um, have, you know, done all the training and and all all of the things that go along with, uh, you know, military service that uh, we're generally familiar with. And so when you say, you know, we're going to lay you off, um, you know, I think qualitatively it's very different. Um, You know, for for a civilian who's in a, you know, management job and, you know, they're not making their annual budget, you know, there may be fiscal reasons, you know, that drive that train or, you know, some other reason. But in the military, what we're talking about is a class of people who have served for a very significant period of time. This is at least six years. Um, you know, we're talking about people who would receive and, and normally do receive an honorable discharge, which means their service was honorable. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, they're now being told that they're not good enough. Uh, you know, they've sacrificed, you know, 10, 15 years of their life. Uh, but they have to go uh, off and do something else uh, when they've committed their entire life, their family, and everything else uh, to the service. So, So uh, Sure, go go ahead. ahead. Well, I was going to say, is this then because of sequestration, um, because all of the the branches have said that they need to downsize in order to um, be able to stay within their budgets? Well, you know, here's the thing. You know, a a budget is, is a political uh, tool, uh, not a, uh, a driver for 
how the service needs to do their job. Mm-hmm. I think that if you went to each and every service individually and you asked them a straight up question, do you have enough people to do what you need to do? The answer is going to be no. And uh, what we're doing is we're taking a political tool, this, this budgeting exercise, and then we're overlaying that onto the military, and they're calling it force shaping or a realignment of the forces or, you know, people have exceeded, you know, their higher tenure and rank so that they need to go. They haven't, you know, passed uh, all of the, the wickets. So it's really, uh, you know, politics, you know, giving, you know, the the driving force to, you know, a lot of excuses or labels that the military is using to, you know, force out, you know, the core of, of the services. I mean, your 10 to 15 year, you know, service member is the one with experience. If you think about the amount of money and investment in, in these individuals that we have, uh, you know, given uh, the leadership that they've developed skills uh, mm-hmm. over that period of time. I mean, there there's so much value in the people that we're talking about and to say we, we can't afford them, you know, what what are the costs associated with each one of these individuals that we're losing after you send them on their way? Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, it, it's just really horrible. Um, typically, the, the, the notice time on these things is, is months. Uh, so you can imagine you've, you've spent 15 years doing something, and, and within four months they're telling you you have to figure something else out to do. Mm-hmm. And it's just not the way... Uh, anybody else is treated, uh, you know, civilians or, or anybody else, and it's really just despicable the way that this is happening right okay. now. Okay. Well, Michael Crockett, you have, a, you this happened to you. That is correct. Um, tell us your story. Tell us what happened. Um, well, I'm a 14-year veteran. Uh, to be exact, I was 36 days shy of making 15 years when I was given the, the notice that I was not tentatively selected to, uh, to stay on active duty. Mm-hmm. Um did you have any warning? Did you did you know that this was coming? They they put out a message stating that the the Navy was going to be restructuring and realigning and that some rates were going to be looked at as overmanned. Were we giving notice individually? Absolutely not. And overmanned means? Meaning that at the E6 level, um, we're required to have, let's just say, 500 Navy-wide. And at our level, we had let's say 650. Mm-hmm. So we were, we were top heavy to, to an extent. <clears throat> and so what I found out after I was ERB'd was the way they actually chose those who would be leaving was based on the year they entered military service, not based on their service record, not based on poor performance. Um, it was those who entered and who were closest to reaching a early retirement or to that point to where, they were locked in and could not be separated unless it was administratively. So I, I think it was politically motivated, but for the most part, I think it was it was on a financial basis. Um, the way they did it, it, it was it disgruntled lots of people based on the fact that there were several sailors or army soldiers who are in for a specific reason. I came in for college money. No, I do not plan on making this a career. So rather than give these sailors a choice to, hey, I would like to leave early, um, like Eric said, they took the vast majority of the leadership, the backbone. That 10 to 15 year span is is very critical to the survivability of a ship Mm -hmm. or a unit. Um, I was reading Navy Times the day before yesterday, and there was an article on how the military or the Navy in general has fallen behind on maintenance and their deployment schedule. All of this is is a reaction of the loss of so many senior personnel. So let's let's talk about you received a letter, I assume, that said that, that you were going to be one of the ones um, to be let go. What first, what went through your mind and then what was the process? Well, I didn't receive the letter. Ah. Uh, My commanding officer and command master chief received the letter and they they brought me to their office and they told me, hey, oh, so I'm sorry you weren't selected. Kind of tough break. Um, We're sorry. All right. You got three months. Now, mind you, I'm on a ship that is in an operational cycle. So I'm going out to sea still. My thought was why I was very, very upset. Um, Mm -hmm. 
I felt thrown away, to be honest with you. Um, I felt like my service was really useless now. So I've been doing this job for 14 years. That's all I know. Um, so for the first first few weeks, I was kind of in shock still. Mm -hmm. um, it, it took a while for me to realize, hey, you need to move your feet because this is coming to an end. Yes, they told us we'd give you severance pay. They did not explain the stipulations behind severance pay. Yeah, and we're going to talk about that in more detail um, in just a little bit. But, And how did you notify your family? Um, well, I called them. I, I called them and let them know, uh, especially my daughter's mother. I let her know, okay, well, this is what's going on. This is what's happened. And the first thing my entire family asked, same question I asked, why? No one had a specific reason as why, because my record was spotless. I was a stellar sailor. Um, on my ship, I worked directly for the executive officer. I had duties of senior E7 and E8 personnel. So why was I thrown into this basket? Mm -hmm. um, so, Eric, let me ask you. I mean, uh, Michael was saying they said uh, troops from 97 um, were selected. I mean, is this just a numbers game or are they actually looking at records and, and, and um, how the service has been handled and so forth? Well, I think what the service would tell you if you asked them is that, of course, they're reviewing the records and going through some process because uh, as, as the federal government is required to do, you have to give notice and hearing. So there's due process. You have to be notified that this is happening and there has to be some mechanism of review. So they would never tell you that that's not happening. Uh, but I think what uh, you know, he's referring to is the fact that, you know, some of this is a numbers crunch. All of it's a numbers crunching game, right? So they're trying to go back to, you know, the Joint Chiefs of Staff and say, hey, we can carve out, you know, this $500 million here if we, you know, remove this class of, of, of sailors, you know, so that we don't have to give them, you know, full retirement or, or partial retirement mm -hmm. uh, eligibility. And, you know, if, if that's the conversation that's going on, what a travesty, because let's think about this. When we do budgets, we don't budget backward. We don't go back to 1969 and say, hey, you know, this is what we need to, you know, pay for this, that, and the other. We look okay. forward, right? And that's what happens with Manning. When you look at force shaping and Manning, it's always looking forward. So the people that are in in 10, 15 years were part of a plan that was executed, you know, probably five years before they even came in because there was this whole force shaping, what does the Navy need and, and whatnot. And there are, are tables that align all of these sailors to jobs and requirements and training and, and all this because all of the funding is tied to that. So you have this entire structure that's built around a plan, and then all of a sudden they're changing the rules of the game at the last minute and, and cutting people with, without, in my opinion, proper justification. Mm -hmm. And I think he makes a great point. You know, the, the way to cut this is not in the middle, not the people that are, are helping keep the services going, but the people at the end, the upper end, the people that are in 25 to 30 years, you know, that probably don't need to be there anymore. The people in the, in, the, in the front end that we haven't invested as much money and time and energy into, and that would probably gladly, you know, walk out and then also have, you know, a lot more opportunity to get a second shot on life. When you're 38 years old or 40 years old being told, you know, you're no good anymore, get out, and then you have to go and try to obtain a job in the civilian community when you haven't properly prepared for that inevitability, uh, you know, that's horrible. Okay, and you're putting people in a very uh, precarious situation, and these aren't just any people. These are people that are sacrificing, you know, ultimately, you know, uh, to have our nation to have all these freedoms and, and benefits. So Absolutely. it's a really, really disgusting uh, scenario that's going on right now. Four four zero two six six five or one eight hundred nine four zero two two four zero are the numbers to call to join our conversation. Um, if you're out there and you have been involuntarily separated from the military. Give us a call and let us hear your story and how you were able to uh, navigate that system. 440-2665 or 1-800-940-2240. So, Michael, let me ask you, uh, how easy was it for you then to say, okay, 
um, first of all, tell us what you did in the service, and then how easy was it to transfer those skills to the civilian world? Uh, I was an operations specialist. Um, and what operations specialists do in a nutshell is they're the guys you see in the movies looking at the radar scope. They're the ones who are making sure navigation is safe, that you know your ship doesn't collide with anything. Now, as far as translating my job skill set into the civilian sector, it's pretty non-existent. Um, they have tools to help you convert that. One source is one of those tools. And being that I'm an operations specialist who is also a combat air controller, um, the skill that it translated to was air traffic control. Mm -hmm. Nothing even close to being an air traffic controller. Because as an air traffic controller, your job is to keep aircraft separated. Right. As an air combat controller, my job is to make them collide. Hmm. So it's the exact opposite. It's the exact opposite. So was it something that you thought you could maybe turn around and, and make it work? If I had applied myself and I had a desire to do that, yes, I could. But that was something I never had an interest in. Um, as far as a career, um, like I said, I, you know, 14 years, I had a career. So I thought, mm -hmm. so transitioning out of the military, I, I threw my hat into the civilian sector when it comes to defense contracting, very difficult to get into. Um, if you don't have recommendations, if you don't have the, the in per se, um, it's very difficult to go based on just your merit Mm -hmm. in your resume alone. So that was very difficult, if not impossible. Plus, in the Virginia area, uh, the Hampton Roads, to be specific, that sector is, is very oversaturated. So realistically, if you're separating and you want in that field, you have to go up further north, northern Virginia, Baltimore, mm -hmm. Maryland area. And when you've vested your time and money in this area, your home, your family. It's hard to say, hey, we need to move in three months. Right. So they said that they would give you separation pay. Is that right? That is correct. Okay. So talk to me about that. What What did that mean to you? And and was it enough to help you to, to be until you could find something else? Was it enough? No. Um, because it was taxed severely. When you're... And I'll just throw this out there. When you're getting 63000 is what they quote you. But by the time they finish taxing it, you're left with 43000 mm -hmm. Okay. 43000 mortgage, car note, monthly bills, expenses, things like mm -hmm. that um, that you've counted on your job for. 43000 goes by very fast, especially if you have not secured employment. Um, the average unemployment amount of benefit that I say, well, that a prior E6 would get would be $378 a week. And you could apply for unemployment. That is correct. Okay. Um, that's not enough to survive on. So severance pay goes only so far if mm -hmm. you cannot find adequate work and, and not just finding work, but now you have to find something that is, compatible or on the same lines of the income you were sustaining. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> I'd say, honestly, severance would last you maybe, <clears throat> maybe eight to nine months. Maybe. So if you got, when you got the severance lump, it comes in the lump sum. It comes in the lump sum. Okay. So if you find a job, do you have to pay that severance back or, or is it that yours to keep? Well, the, the severance, the way they worked it out, if you have a disability and you apply for your disability benefits, mm -hmm. whatever your rating is, whether it's 10% to 100%, if you took a severance pay, you cannot receive any of your benefits until your severance is paid back in full. Uh, that applies to if you chose to retire out of the reserves also. Mm -hmm. So it, it was more as a loan. We're going to loan you this money. Once you start getting your benefits, we're taking it back. 
So if that's something you were counting on, now you have another three, maybe four years of suffering before you can. While you're paying back this money. That's correct. 440-2665 or 1-800-940-2240. Desmond joins us from Yorktown. Hi, Desmond. You're on the air. Hi. How are you today? Okay. I, I was I actually just wanted to make a comment about some of the stuff um, that the gentleman were making. Uh, uh, and I know that I, I did 20 years, in, actually 22 years in, in the Army. I don't know about the Navy. But I know this, that I know some of the stuff seems like it's unfair, but some of those planners have to govern our military, and there is civilian oversight over the military. Now, I know it may seem like it's political, but they do something called a QDR every year. And that QDR, what it does is it what matches does, what... Let me interrupt you one second, Desmond. What does, a Q, what does QDR stand for? It stands for Qualitative Defense uh, Review. Okay. What it does is it dictates what the president says that our mission will be for that year or over a five-year period. And they try to match that with the manning requirements of the services. And that's how they come up with those numbers. Now, in the Army, I don't know about the Navy. What they do is uh, um, another, it's another acronym, but what, it, what the acronym actually does is it, it does actually look at the performance of people. Mm-hmm. Like, say, for instance, they, the gentleman mentioned earlier, they might have 600 E6s across the Army. They're going to look at those E6s, and they have, we have something called a retention control point, meaning that if you've been in the military for a certain amount of years, you can't be that same rank once you go past those certain amount of years. So I know it may seem unfair, but they're saying the military is based on attrition. And that attrition says that if you go, if you're not moving up, you have to get out. There's a lot of things in the military that are discriminators, and that's just the nature of military service. For instance, PT. If you can't pass your PT test, you got to get out. If you're pregnant, you have an option of getting out. If you're overweight, you got to get out. If misconduct, you got to get out. So there, there are discriminators in the military that don't fit into the civilian world. Okay, let me let, let me let Eric respond to what you're saying, Desmond, because, Eric, there, that is true, that there are, are certain factors that can cause separation from the services because of behavior. But when we're talking about involuntary separation, that's a little different, isn't it? Well, it, there are two categories of involuntary separation. What, what the gentleman is speaking to is, it, it sounds like at least partially, uh, is focused on people who aren't making the cut. You know, they know the rules of the game. They're not applying themselves and, and make conforming to the standards that are required of the military. And so the military is making a determination that they no longer, you know, uh, ready to be in the service. And, and I agree with that. There are, are many reasons uh, why that can be the case. But what I think we're trying to focus on is this other class of, you know, service members who don't have these issues in their record and it becomes, you know, personality driven and, you know, it it is a very political system. And if you look at some of the records and I I deal with some of this, I mean, I've got officers and senior enlisted that are coming to me that are, well, I would consider rock stars in their fields and in their uh, service. And they're just being told to go home. Some, I had a major recently who was deployed overseas in combat right now. They walked up and said, you got to pack your stuff. You're out in a month. And, you know, this, this guy was leading, uh, you know, a company. So it just it's just it doesn't make any sense, you know, at least globally what's going on. I understand what the gentleman's talking about. There are processes, there are systems and people do need to be looked at because just because you're in the service, you just you're not getting a ticket for 20 years. It doesn't work like that. You have to earn the next you know, step in. But, you know, what we're talking about is a class of people who were doing everything they were supposed to do. And all of a sudden the service says, you know, you know, we, we got too many people. If you look at the service size for each of the services over the past 15, 20 years, they really haven't moved all that much. We're talking maybe, you know, 20, 30, 40,000 in the army up or down, you know, the, the Marine Corps has moved about, you know, 20, 30,000 either way. So, you know, what we're saying, we're not making drastic changes to the, uh, and, uh, you know, cap, we're, we're talking, you know, fairly minor, 
you know, movements. And if we're targeting people who are doing everything that they're supposed to do, you know, why can't there be savings other places? I will tell you, and there's nobody on this call that's going to, you know, tell me that in the service there isn't fraud, waste, and abuse going on all over the place. And there are other ways to be more efficient, to square things away in such a way that we can, you know, take care of the people who are doing what they need to do and save the money that they need to save. If you're just joining us, we're talking about involuntary separation from the military military with Michael Crockett, a Navy veteran, and Eric Montalvo, an attorney and a former Marine. Michael, I saw you nodding your head as Eric was talking. Uh, I absolutely agree with him. Um, I understand that the Army has their way of weeding out, um, but it's it's on a totally different level. The same way their level of advancement is separate from the Navy. The Navy advances based on testing. The Army advances based on several things, whether it be physical testing and mental testing. So to say that, okay, if you're stuck at the same rank for too long, you have to go, that's a problem with with the, the military, Navy as a whole, because now you've got so many E7s, 8s, and 9s occupying positions to where there is no room for an E6 to advance. Should he be penalized for that? Mm-hmm. Absolutely not. When we talk about the severance money, there there's different there are different levels depending on how long you've been in. And when you reach 15 years, um, if I'm not mistaken, there's an opportunity to um, perhaps retire under what they call Terra, which is temporary um, uh, retirement. And you were too short. Is that right? I was 36 days short of 15 years. Wow. Eric, what does that mean in terms of how people can handle what they're going on? Would I mean, doesn't that seem unfair for 36 days? Well, it's completely unfair, and it's deliberate. Um, I routinely see commands, you know, looking for, you know, that the timeline to make sure that they get the technical win and get somebody out, you know, before they need to. This also happens when you see reservists that are approaching the 18-year mark. So you have the reservists that were called active duty, they're doing their time, uh, their career retirement eligibility, and then all of a sudden they have a flag in the system that says, oh, if they reach 18 years, then they can be converted to active duty military retirement. We can't do that. We can't afford that. So cut them off. So here you have, you know, these are people. These are human beings. These are your fellow, you know, brothers and sisters, mothers and fathers, service member that are out there doing their job every day and all of a sudden we're using numbers and, and you know tax issues and, and whatnot to say, you know, they've got to go. And so that's that's the problem here. It it really is about trying you know, these weird, strange, you know, little math projects that they're uh, engaging upon to get people out of the service. That's not right. You know, if you if you're not meeting the standards because you're not meeting the standards individually, if you don't have, you know, your individual responsibility and do what you have to do to serve every day, that's a separate issue. What we're talking about are people that are doing everything that they're supposed to be doing, and now the politics and, you know, the corruption of this thing is coming down and saying, no, we're going to take this class of people and just move them out because that's going to help us get a number that we're trying to get to. That's not what the service is about. That's not what, you know, the military is about, and that's not what America is about. You know, we owe these people something, and we owe them to give them a fair opportunity to do what they need to do. And if we're not going to do that, then we need to build things into the system to prepare them for this potential, you know, outcome. And they're not doing that. I will tell you that he was not sitting there for 14 years with somebody telling him, "Uh uh-oh, any day they could come to the door and say you're going to get kicked out. That's not the way this works. He was doing everything he needed to do. He was showing up every day. Deploying where he was told to deploy, listening to orders and directions, you know, each and every day, you know, 24-7, and then all of a sudden one day he gets, he gets the notice. That's how this works. So the services have all of this information and manipulation, but the service member is basically, you know, uh, beholden to somebody's, you know, arbitrary decision. And that, that is not a, a proper setup. So, Eric, can you, can you appeal? Can you... Sue, can you, is there anything you can do or you just stuck with the decision once it happens? Well, I mean, appeals. So, um, you know, each case is unto itself. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, if, if, 
you see yourself very close to a certain you know time you know it's hard to say because you know every every case is different you know right. you have different you know uh, you know because some people are reservists active duty national guard what have you so you know there's so many different variations of this but the, the best thing for somebody to do is don't lay down on it go and seek out counsel because you know they you the other problem with the service is we we're told and taught to do what we're told to do. And so, you know, when they say, hey, you've got to go in three months, the, the thing in your brain isn't, oh, I can fight this and, you know, challenge it and, and do that. It's, oh, I've got to pack my stuff and, and get out of here, you know, and figure this out. Mm-hmm. So, you know, what I would encourage people to do is if they're in the situation, you know, go seek counsel and, and find out what options you may have. You know, sometimes you may be able to transition to National Guard preserve things. Sometimes you may be able to parlay your service into government service and buy back that service if it, if it's qualified. You know, so there there are many other things that you can look at to try to offset, you know, uh, uh what's happening. So seeking out some counsel that that knows what's going on and can sort of run through the the possible options is, is worth uh the time to do it. Michael, did you think about going into the reserves? Was that an option for you? I did. I I took the reserves. Um <clears throat> I'm in the reserves now. Mm-hmm. Um but I think after my second year in the reserves, I found out that retiring out of reserves isn't really beneficial. In what way? Uh, The retirement pay is substantially lower than what it would have been if I was on active duty. Retirement pay is taxable. Mm -hmm. So having a service-connected disability, as bad as it sounds, you profit more to just get out of the reserves, stick with your disability pay because it's non-taxable and you get it immediately versus waiting until you're 62 to try to survive. If I can ask, how old are you? I'm 36. 36, okay. So you've got a long time to work, to continue to work and to to continue to uh, have a career. That is correct. I was ERB'd out in 2012, September 2nd. So from that time frame to now, the job market is, has been very slim um, because, like I said earlier, it's very hard to get into that sector without going to school, finding another trade. Mm-hmm. So the one thing I can say that <clears throat> being told I was being separated did for me is it made me get off my tail and get back in school. So you did go back to school? I went back to school. I received my bachelor's in criminal justice with a specialization in homeland security. Um, I didn't stop there. Um, I figured, okay, well, a bachelor's nowadays isn't going to cut it. you got to have your master's. So I'm pursuing my master's right now. Mm-hmm. Um, so do you get the same, the benefits, though, for for education, for your medical benefits? Do all of those go away also they when don't, you were? They don't go away. Uh, I, I am receiving my post-9-11 GI Bill, but as far as medical and dental, whereas I was paying a substantially smaller sum on active duty. Mm-hmm. You just pay a little bit more and you have co-pays to pay. It's in a sense, it is better than having nothing. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's, it's still a significant change from what, from what you, the conditions I was used to. Yes. Four, four, zero, two, six, six, five, or one, eight hundred nine, four, zero, two, two, four, zero. Give us a call. Let us know if you're active duty or if you're retired, what you think about involuntary separation. Brian joins us from Hampton. Hi, Brian. You're on the air. Hey, thanks so much for taking my call. Sure. Um, I wanted to kind of agree with what Desmond is saying. I think this is a great conversation, and uh, I thank both the gentlemen you have in the line for their service. But I think the difficult part is that we're putting a face and a story to the fact that we are the military. When our operations change and we lose tanks or we lose MRAPs or we have to decommission ships, there's no question about it. But because we put, you know, people... You know, we're, we're assets as well, and I think from day one in the military, what we're taught is, one, that nobody is irreplaceable. You know, all of us have uh, a, a time frame where our careers will end, and anybody can walk up and replace us. And the second thing is that one thing that I can, you know, speak to the fact the military has done a great job with, at least the Navy, in the past few years, is making uh, the opportunities for our sailors known to them, you know. We talk about jobs afterwards, but we have 
programs like the U.S. MAP program, which allows sailors to become journeymen in specific trades, um, the Navy Cool program, and our college program. So the opportunities are out there. Brian, are you, heard, are, you after, are you active duty or retired? I am, yeah. You're I'm active duty, active duty yep. now? Yep. Okay. Yeah, How long I'm, have you I'm been in? Navy, I've been for uh, 12 years. Okay. Um, has anyone in your unit or, or um, on the ships that you served um, been involuntarily separated? Absolutely. Yeah, I had to send uh, six sailors home during what we called the ERB, which was just a few years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and it's tough. But again, you know, I, I think that it's a culture that should, you know, that we're getting better at cultivating is explaining to these sailors, look, your time can come. And, uh, you know, we're going to shake your hand and, and pat you on the back, but you should be preparing from day one. Okay. And there's a lot of opportunities out there. Brian, let me let our uh, panelists respond. Thank you so much for your call. Michael? I, I understand what he's saying, and I'm, I'm assuming Brian's uh, a chief, uh, because that's, that is the sound of a chief. Yes, you should always be preparing for the future. You should always be preparing for something else. But you're also preparing to make the military your career, and that's what most sailors are doing. They're preparing to stay in the military, which is why they study to make advancement. Yes, education is important, uh, and I'll be the first to stress that you should always be bettering yourself. But when you're devoting yourself to the military, to your current rate, to be the best at what you do, mm -hmm. it's hard to say, hey, well, you okay, I understand, go pick up this rating manual and study, but hey, here's some job applications, here's some formats to fill out your resume. I want you to have this on standby because tomorrow you may not have a job. I just don't think that it's it's personal. That just makes absolutely no sense to do okay. because that will create a culture who absolutely cares nothing about the product of their work in the military. Um, so your whole point is, is, is if you're focused on making it a career, you're going to do better in terms of, of your job Absolutely. than being worried about being riffed. You will not be distracted by thinking, hey, I need to find a job for this in the next five years. Mm -hmm. You'll be focused on, hey, how can I better myself? How can I better my sailors or my junior personnel that I'm supposed to be training up mm -hmm. to take my job? Eric, let me ask you this. Um, I, I understand that um, each military member signs a contract when you go into the military. Um, is this the idea that you may not be able to make this a career included in that contract? Well, there are a couple of different things. One, I want to comment on the culture piece sure. because, you know, it, you know, when you're in, when in the civilian sector, there's a one demarcation that's called a 1099 versus a salaried employee. And, you know, those derive, those people derive different benefits depending upon, you know, what system they're on. And, you know, 1099s are the contract employees and, you know, the salary people are sort of your full time or, you know, hourly full time. So, or part time, what have you. But, you know, when, when you're talking about, uh, military service members, you know, there, there's a, a completely different thing going on, right? This isn't about, you know, I'm going to go and be the manager at, you know, Home Depot for, uh, you know, a little bit. Yeah, the contracts in the beginning are there. Why? Because the investment in one of these individuals is so significant that the military service does not want to lose out in getting these people in. So if you think about it, let's say somebody comes in, we spend about one hundred fifty, two hundred thousand dollars to get them through training, you know, trained up on an MOS, you know, you know, all of that, you know, mm -hmm. cultured, acclimatized, the whole nine yards. We get them, we PCS them, we take their stuff, move it across country. So we're spending money, 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 money. We get them there, and they're like, eh, I don't like this anymore. So they walk away. Mm. Does the service want that to happen? Because that's what they're saying that they're going to do. So why can't it be mutual? Why can't the service member walk away just like the service has them, you know, locked into this contract? Because they don't want to lose the money. They don't want to be injured, right? They don't want to lose the capacity, the manpower. So they require, it, you know, these terms of, of contract to make sure that they uh, have people on the hook. So, you know, if we're going to have a culture of it's, you know, you versus me, and at any point in time, you can walk away, well, why can't the service member have that same option? 
Why are we trying to lock people in? We're locking people in because we need the people. We need to have these, and that, that's one of the reevaluations that goes on constantly. So you have this reevaluation that the person is needed, and all of a sudden we're saying, oh, well, now we're going to change the rules halfway through that contract. Uh, you know, have a nice day. That's, that's what we're talking about, and okay. that, that, that doesn't make any sense. So there, there has to be some look at the culture, because if you're recruiting out there and you're saying, hey, come into the military service, but understand that at any given day we're going to tell you to go home, wh- why would you join? I got you. I would Let's rather go. work for Home Depot for 20 years as opposed to walking into the service, having to be put in the middle, middle of uh, you know operation whatever, and then being told, you know, pack your stuff, leave, we're done with you. What kind, what kind of military is that? Is that, what, is that what we're advocating for? <laughs> okay, let's see if we can get some calls in. Francis joins us from South Mill, North Carolina. Hi, Francis. You're on the air. Hi. I really enjoy your show. Thank um, you. I am so sorry. I don't remember the gentleman's name that was discharged, but... Mr. Crockett? Uh, Michael Crockett. Oh, hi, my, Michael. Um, How you doing? Fine, thank you. My husband's retired uh, Coast Guard. And I, I don't know if you've considered um, transferring uh, your – because you, your 15 years would not be eliminated uh, if you have considered another service such as Coast Guard, uh, the Air Force. Um, the Coast Guard, I, the gentleman was talking about how the military is treating uh, you and other, many, many others. Uh, the Coast Guard doesn't work that way. Um, you no, uh, If you don't make – E5 within 10 years, then you're out. Um, but once you make E5, you're in for, you know, you know, 20, 30 years, however long you want to stay. Okay. So, so I just wanted to put that out there. Thank you, Francis, for that call. I appreciate that. Michael. Now, to, to, to respond to that question, yes, um, <clears throat> I did examine going to other branches of service, but once you reach a certain time frame, you have a certain amount of years in the military, certain branches will not take you. Uh, I know for a fact the Air, For- Air mm-hmm. Force, once you've passed uh, four to eight years, they will not accept Navy because it's just too hard to retrain you and break you of that. Um, mm-hmm. Honestly, if I, had, if I had had access to the Coast Guard when I was thinking about enlisting, I would have I joined the Coast Guard because I had the pleasure of doing an internship um, in downtown Portsmouth at the Coast Guard Lant Fleet headquarters. And I will say those are some of the most educated junior sailors I've ever met. I I worked with uh, E3s and E4s with masters and doctorate degrees. Um, but my... Go, go ahead. I was going to say, let me ask you one question because we've got about five minutes left. And I don't want to get this in. When a service member is told that they're going to be separated... What is the atmosphere while they're still working? I mean, are are your fellow sailors supportive? Is it is it fear? I mean, what what goes on when all of a sudden there's this group of people there that just found out that they're going to be separated? You, you get it all. You get support. You get shock because you have to think about it. These are the the people that have been working side by side with you for years. These are the people you've trained most likely. They know your work ethic and they think, wow, if he, he was doing it correct and they did this to him, what are they going to do with us? Are we next? Um, so were there a lot of people in your unit or on your ship? uh, On my ship? No, there were only three, three. Uh, There were only three people. Person, though, all E6. Well, let, let, mm-hmm. let me jump in and make a quick sure. point here, mm-hmm. and that is um, what you just heard. And you know, I, I echo uh, what the gentleman says. You know, the Coast Guard people, uh, all of them that I've encountered are fantastic. You know, one of the best uh, units or uh, you know, uniform personnel that uh, you can encounter. They're, they are, you know, doing real life stuff all the time, and, and you know. Uh, really solid group of people. Mm -hmm. But what's even more important about this is what you've heard is the Army does something different than the Navy, than the Coast Guard, than the Marine Corps, Mm. okay, and the Air Force. Why is that? Why is that? That's a good question. Why is that? service (laughs) members serving our country, Mm -hmm. why did they get to choose? The Coast Guard does it right, right? Or maybe Mm -hmm. they do it right. But they they definitely do it different. And so what they're trying to do is take care of their people, 
and make uh, create lines of demarcation where you understand and can have the proper expectations, both for the service as well as the individual. Mm-hmm. And so maybe the other services should start looking around and see how they can do business better, because this isn't a mandate coming down from on high. It's a directive that says you need to look at this, and then each service is interpreting it, and you get these sergeants majors and these commanding generals that are starting to you know play with things to say, well, let's get this crew out or let's let's do that. Maybe that's not the right way, and I think that's why we're having this conversation is to say, let's look at this and figure out why is everybody doing things differently, and maybe there is a better way uh, forward Mm -hmm. and not the way that uh, we've been doing business in in the past. So in the last two minutes that we have, I want to ask each of you, first, Michael, from your perspective, what would you tell someone who – who's just been called in by their commander and told that they are going to be involuntary, uh, involuntarily separated. What would you tell them the first thing they should do? Seek counsel outside of your command. Seek counsel outside of the military uh, when it comes to taking care of you because they have their own interests at heart. So it's your life. It's your career. How bad do you want it? Are you willing to fight for it? Yes, there's only so far you can go, but you have to try something. You have to try if it's if it's worth it. Um, and okay. just just stay positive because it's it can send you into depression very fast. So you have a long road to hope. That's Michael Crockett. He is a former uh, a retired. Not retired. <laughs> a <laughs> Navy <wish>. veteran. <laughs> yes. <laughs> who is now working on his master's degree. And so we wish you the both best of luck in that, Michael. Eric, you. you've got one minute to, for the last comment. What would you tell sure. people uh, to do? Uh, seek, uh, as he said, seek counsel uh, outside of the military. You know, get, get somebody who knows what they're talking about and, and have an honest conversation. There's life after the military. You can all do it. The skills you learn leadership, discipline, they're all applicable, and nobody loves you like you love yourself. I know there's an orientation of selfless service and, 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 you know, do for your country, but when that, you know, hammer comes down, you need to take care of yourself and your family, and so you really need to reorient. It's not about the Navy anymore. It's about you and your family and your future, so take that serious and, and don't let them you know, take that away from you. Okay, that's Eric Montalvo, an attorney and a former Marine. Thank you so much, Eric, for joining us. And all of you all who called in, I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of your calls, but be sure to send us your comments at anotherviewradio.org, and we will be right back. It is Sammy A. Hey, this is Tommy Davis here listening to Another View on 89.5 FM. You brought me here from that big golden nugget in the sky, and I love you for your magical ways. I've got high hopes. I've got high hopes. I tell you, you never know what our transition is going to be. <laughs> WHRO-TV is airing a 10-part series that explores the heritage of 29 prominent, Amer- prominent Americans. This is the second season for Finding Your Roots with Henry Louis Gates. Dr. Gates has delved into the ancestries of storytellers like Ken Burns, activists like Benjamin Jealous, and entertainers like Angela Bassett. As part of our local contribution to the series, our Lisa Godley spoke to members of the Tucker family, Brenda Tucker Doswell, Alexander Tucker, William Tucker, and Carol Tucker Jones are descendants of William Tucker, the first African child born in Virginia. The siblings recently shared their story at Hampton's Point Comfort, where their family's contribution to American history began. The Tucker family has always taken pride in being descendants of the first African child born in Virginia. Our ancestors came on a ship in 1619, and William Tucker was the first African child born in the Virginia colony. A marker on the shores of Hampton's Point Comfort shares the story of Anthony and Isabella's arrival. Twenty-some-odd Negroes on the ship, the White Lion, came to Point Comfort. Captain William Tucker, who was commanding this fort, selected two people to work his plantation. 
They named their first child after him, and upon the captain's death, he left land to their son, William Tucker, which stayed in the family for many generations. We visited Bluebird Gap Farm not knowing anything, and when we got there, my father said, this, is, this was our home, this is where we were. In fact, the Tucker Family Cemetery is just a few miles away from what is now Hampton's historic Aberdeen Gardens community. My father and I spent a lot of time together in his business and cleaning the yard, cleaning the cemetery. And when we cleaned the cemetery, that's when we had the conversation. He told us about the land that was given to Captain William Tucker and the land that was passed on to the family. Because of records lost or never kept, many people of African descent can only trace their roots back so far. So for an African-American family to be able to trace their roots back to 1619 is rare. But the Tuckers didn't stop there. The youngest of the siblings, William, took a DNA test. A segment of DNA is presently found in Africa's Ghana. According to uh, our test, we see that you are a part of the, uh, the African tribes from that region that entered the country at that time frame. A trip from Africa to the Virginia coast, beginning a family's legacy that now takes its rightful place in American history. It's very important and we share with one another. We laugh and we share, tell stories about each other. We realized that the history is important. Everybody has history. We felt very fortunate that we were able to get back uh, so far. And you can watch the Tucker family story on WHRO TV 15 this coming Tuesday night, just prior to the Finding Your Roots series, which airs at 8 p.m. This past Tuesday, Dr. Gates explored the family histories of Angela Bassett, Valerie Jarrett, and Nas. And this coming Tuesday, he will discover the Jewish heritage of Alan Dershowitz, Carol King, and Tony Kushner. Finding Your Roots airs Tuesdays at 8 on WHRO TV 15. And I'd like to encourage you to attend the fourth annual Family Reunion Family Enrichment Conference at Brown Hall on the campus of Norfolk State University tomorrow, November 1st, beginning at 9 a.m. There are workshops for the entire family on everything from parenting to relationships to financial help and more. The event is free and open to the public public, call 757-823-2650 to find out more. And I also want to encourage you to vote on Tuesday. The midterm elections are usually down in terms of the number of people who vote, and we all need to exercise our right to vote. So if you need help getting uh, transportation, you can contact uh, organizations such as the Urban League and others, and they will help you. But please, everyone, remember, Tuesday, it's time to vote. We invite you to visit our website, anotherviewradio.org. There you'll find podcasts of all of our shows, and you can sign up for our eView newsletter. It's a once-a-week reminder of upcoming programs. Next week, a two-topic show, a new direction for Habitat for Humanity, Southampton Roads, and the latest information you need to sign up for health care under the Affordable Care Act. Our theme music was composed and performed by Jay Sennett. Lisa Godley is our show producer. Victor Bowen is our audio engineer. And Kamaria Mason answered our phones. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. Be careful out there as you celebrate Halloween this evening. And let's get together again next Friday at noon for another view. <laughs>